Hello and welcome to ProTech Equipment Resources uh, webinar on acceptance and maintenance testing of medium voltage electrical power cables. My name is Tom Sandry. I'm the uh, Director of Technical Support here at ProTech Equipment Resources and uh, I'll be taking you through the presentation today. Um, before we get started uh, in the presentation, uh, perhaps a good place to start is talking just a little bit about uh, cables in general. The power cable market can be segmented into three areas based upon the voltage class of the cable. We have the medium voltage uh, class, which will typically represent uh, cables from 6 kV up and through 69 kV. The high voltage uh, cable class, which uh, typically will be then 69 kV up through and including 150 kV. And then the extra high voltage, uh, which would be those cables greater than 150 kV. The medium voltage uh, cable dominates the underground cable market segment. Insulated power cables are used for the transmission and distribution of electricity. Uh, both for industrial and commercial and various underground applications. In a typical medium voltage cable, copper and or aluminum wires, and these can be stranded and or solid, uh, are used as the conductors. These conductors are covered with an extruded polymeric uh, stress control layer made of semiconductive compounds. This is often referred to as the perma shield, although it will also be referred to as a strand shield or conductor shield. The insulation layer immediately surrounds and is fully bonded with the uh, conductor shield. An insulation shield encases, excuse me, an insulation shield encases the insulation and in some cases may be uh, composed of the same semiconductive material as the conductor shield. The copper neutral wires are wound around the insulation shield and are usually covered with a thermoplastic uh, polyethylene jacket for mechanical protection from the external environment and also to reduce moisture intrusion into the cable, all of which can uh, cause a premature cable failure. Now, there are two basic categories for uh, cables, um, the extruded dielectric and the laminated style cable. Uh, examples of the extruded dielectric cables will include the uh, cross-linked polyethylene or polyethylene XLPE or PE style cables. Also we would have the uh, ethylene propylene rubber or EPR would also be another example of, of an extruded dielectric. Then the paper insulated lead covered or PILC would be a representation of the typical laminated style cables. Taking a look at and talking a little bit about aging characteristics, uh, we can look at or discuss this phenomenon referred to as treeing. Water tree degradation is a major problem for medium voltage extruded dielectric cables particularly the service aged XLPE and PE style cables. It is perhaps the worst degradation process of the polymeric insulation that contributes to the failure of the cable. Now, water trees are formed and grow in the presence of moisture, impurities or contamination, and electric field over time. Bowtie, excuse me, there are generally two types of water trees, namely the bowtie tree and the vented tree. And we can see illustrations or pictures of here we have a bowtie. And then over in this slide is where we would see the vented uh, style trees. Now, bowtie trees are water trees that grow from the insulation outward toward the surfaces of the insulation. These trees grow in the direction of the electric field in both directions toward the two electrodes, the electrodes being the uh, center conductor of the cable and the concentric neutral uh, surrounding uh, the cable. Now, bowtie trees have a faster initial growth rate as compared to the vented tree. The bowtie trees are, however, not capable of growing to large sizes and usually do not 
grow to a size significant enough to cause a failure in the insulating system. Now vented trees are water trees that grow from the surface of the polymer inward into the insulating system. The trees will grow in the direction of the electric field. Vented trees have a lower initial growth rate as compared to the bowtie tree. However, a vented tree is capable of growing right through the entire insulation thickness. And we actually show an illustration of that where here we have a vented tree that has grown or migrated completely through the insulating wall thickness. So the vented trees are definitely uh, the more problematic of the tree series um, and will go ahead and lead to uh, in surface age cables eventual electrical failure or uh, fault mode. Now in the case of extruded dielectric, uh, the uh, treeing is a uh, result of water ingress uh, and contamination as referred to as a water tree. In laminated cables, the most common cause of the treeing effect is from the drying of the oil and then the burning of the insulating layers of paper. Um, as the insulating layers of paper burn, they leave behind uh, carbon deposits, which are conductive, so in time, as the uh, uh, papers begin to burn, leaving behind little carbon deposits, uh, we do, in essence, get a conductive path through the insulation and, again, a cable failure. Uh, this type of treeing is referred to as a carbon tree. And over in the slide here, we can see examples of the little carbon deposits that are left behind as the papers begin to burn and again the name really stems from the pattern that uh, this takes on where it just looks like the branches of a tree. Over the years there have been several methods uh, and or philosophies regarding the testing of underground electric power cables in the field. The Insulated Conductor Committee of the IEEE uh, Power and Energy Society has divided these methods or philosophies into two fundamental categories, the Type 1 field test and the Type 2 field test. A Type 1 test uh, is intended to detect defects in the insulation of the cable system in order to improve the service reliability after the defective part is removed and appropriate repairs are performed. These tests are usually achieved by application of moderately increased voltage across the insulation for a prescribed duration of time. Such tests are categorized as a pass or fail, go or no go type of a test. The tests uh, in a type 1 uh, can include insulation resistance performed with a standard megometer and this is typically uh, referred to as an under voltage test when using a uh, megometer for insulation resistance uh, testing. We also have the uh, DC high potential test or DC high pot test and the DC high pot test is described in the IEEE 400.1 um, guide for field testing of laminated dielectric shielded power cable systems rated 5 kV and above with high direct current voltage. Another uh, type 1 style test uh, would be the VLF or very low frequency high potential test or VLF high pot test. Now the VLF high pot is described in IEEE 400.2 guide for field testing of shielded power cable systems using very low frequency or VLF. And then finally, we do have the AC high potential test, which is performed at power frequency. Uh, this would be either a 50 hertz or a 60 hertz. Now, due to the size of the equipment required to do an AC high pot test on a very highly capacitive uh, um, device under test, uh, such as cable, normally the uh, power frequency test is something that is reserved and done at the factory and in the cable labs, but doesn't lend itself well for field use. Uh, the VLF high pot, by dropping the frequency, reduces the physical size and weight uh, and the VA requirements for energizing uh, long lengths of cable. So you'll find that VLF high pots are uh, more commonly used for field application 
AC, 50 or 60 hertz uh, um, style high pots are typically used more in uh, laboratory um, or factory environments. Now, let's talk a little bit about type 2 tests. Type 2 tests are intended to provide indications that the insulation system has deteriorated. Hence, they are diagnostic style tests. Uh, these tests will include, but not necessarily be limited to, the dissipation factor or tan delta testing. Uh, partial discharge uh, would be a type 2 uh, style test. This can be performed both in the field or in the laboratory. And partial discharge is described in the IEEE 400.3 guide for partial discharge testing of shielded power cable systems in a field environment. Other type 2 tests that have uh, uh, surfaced over the years is uh, what's called the oscillating wave test, the dielectric discharge test, relaxation current, and return voltage tests. During this webinar, uh, we will explore the various philosophies and techniques commonly in practice uh, today. Particular focus uh, is going to be given to topics such as the insulation resistance test, the DC high potential test, the VLF high potential test, TAN delta testing, and also uh, attention to partial discharge testing. Now, one of the uh, questions that was uh, posed during the original uh, live webinar version of uh, today's session, um, we had a question uh, that basically asked, what type of testing is performed on uh, cable and cable systems? Um, is the type of testing the same throughout the life of the cable? And the answer to uh, the individual who raised that question um, was, for the purpose of this webinar, um, we can categorize testing into three areas. And we will categorize them into installation tests, Installation tests uh, are field tests that are conducted after cable installation, but before splicing and terminating uh, has occurred. The test is intended to detect shipping, storing, and or installation damages. The second style of tests are the acceptance tests. Now, field tests made after cabling system installation and including the splicing and the terminations but before the cable is placed into normal service. The tests are intended to further detect installation damages and to show any gross defect or errors in installation of the various system components. And then finally, we have the maintenance style tests. Now, maintenance style tests are field tests that are made during the operating life of a cabling system. They are intended to detect deterioration of the system and to check the serviceability so that suitable maintenance procedures can be initiated. Okay, let's start with under voltage tests uh, utilizing DC voltage. Under voltage tests are, un excuse me, under voltage tests are typically performed with a megometer. Since the tests use voltages under the rating of the insulation, the test is considered to be a non-destructive test and does not produce any of the ill effects associated with a high voltage direct current test. Tests can be either a type 1 pass or fail, go or no go test, or we can also use uh, insulation resistance tests as a diagnostic uh, test or a type 2 style test. Diagnostic insulation tests electrically stimulate the insulation and measure the response. Dependent upon that response, we can draw some conclusions about the condition or the overall health of the insulation. Now, one of the questions that was posed in our original uh, webinar was, can any megometer, a 1 kV, 5 kV, or 10 kV style megometer be used in this application? Um, for basic troubleshooting purposes, any of the meters can be used. 
Traditionally, however, the 5 kV uh, insulation resistance tester and or megometer, if you will, has been the uh, unit associated with testing medium voltage uh, power cables, but we can just as easily run the test at 1 kV or at a higher uh, voltage if we choose to. Some of your common manufacturers of this type of equipment, we have the Megger insulation resistance test set or megometer, uh, also uh, AEMC instruments, and Mattrell would be uh, various vendors that manufacture this type of equipment. Now, let's look at the simple insulation resistance or what is called the IR test. In perfect ins if perfect insulation exists, there would be no flow of electrical current through the insulation to ground. But since no insulation has infinite resistance, there is always some leakage current flowing through uh, the insulation. Now, while a small amount of current through a good insulation is not a problem, difficulties arise when the insulation begins to deteriorate and the leakage current begins to increase. The insulation resistance test measures the resistance of the insulation material to the flow of the leakage current, helping you to judge the condition of the insulation. When you make this test, you can either measure the resistance or you can measure the flow of the leakage current. So most of your modern day megometers, uh, particularly the digital versions as opposed to the old analog scales, the unit will allow you to either view the actual leakage current uh, flowing through the insulating system in uh, amperage and or will show you the ohmic value typically read in megohms, gigohms, or terohms. Here's a simple example of how a megometer uh, can be used for troubleshooting among uh, cable phases. So in this example, we're basically going to use the megometer as a type 1 pass or fail. We go ahead and we connect the negative terminal to the center conductor of the cable, the positive terminal to the concentric neutral, and here, uh, for instance, our measurement may be 1,500 megohms. As we move on to the second phase, again, we connect the negative terminal of the megometer to the center conductor, positive terminal to the concentric neutral, obtain our measurement, for instance, 100,000 ohms or 100 K ohms. And now connection to the third phase, and we render a result of perhaps 1,480 mega ohms. So in this example, what we uh, have clearly shown here is there definitely seems to be a problem uh, with the second phase where we were recording insulation resistance values in and around uh, 1,500 mega ohms. The center phase or B phase in this example here clearly is a significant uh, value under the other two phases. So this is an example of um, how we can go ahead and utilize uh, this technology to go ahead and perform just a simple troubleshooting test. Now, one of the uh, questions that uh, has you know come up from time to time, as I went through the connections here, uh, you may have noticed that uh, I was placing the negative uh, terminal of the megometer on the center conductor, uh, in essence making the measurement uh, negative with reference to ground. Now with modern insulating materials, there is little, if any, difference in the reading obtained, regardless of uh, which way the terminals of the test set are connected. However, it is industry best practice uh, to go ahead and connect the positive lead to the ground. In fact, uh, the output polarity of DC high pots manufactured on the market today and also uh, surge generators or thumpers are also set up in this fashion where they are negative polarity, uh, positive ground uh, type of connections. 
Now the reason for this is that in older insulating systems, a little known phenomena called, uh, I'm gonna have a hard time pronouncing this, but I'm gonna give it a, a good college try here. A uh, phenomena called electroendosmosis <laughs> causes a lower insulation reading to be obtained with the positive terminal connected to the grounded side of the insulation being tested. Since the insulation testing is uh, typically concerned with safety, maintenance, and or troubleshooting, the worst case reading would be the one that yields the most relevant information. So because of this uh, phenomena of electroendosmosis, <laughs> it has become industry best practice to simply connect uh, positive with reference to ground. Okay, moving along in our uh, presentation here. Again, type one test, we show where two phases pass, one phase fails. Okay, let's move on to interpreting uh, the uh, test data. If the insulation resistance reading was high and if it increased or remained steady during the test, the insulation is said to be good. Current decreases as insulation resistance increases. If the insulation resistance reading decreased during the test, the insulation of the uh, cable probably is wet and or otherwise in bad condition. If the final value of the insulation resistance test is low or the leakage current is found to be high, the insulation of the cable is in poor condition. Okay, interpreting uh, the data. Okay, here are some basic rule of thumb values to give you an idea of what to expect for a 15 kV cable at 68 degrees Fahrenheit in a typical medium length route. Okay, we go ahead and we connect on. Now here I'm also showing the use of the guard terminal uh, in this particular slide. Um, the G or the guard terminal uh, is not uh, in any way intended to be a ground terminal. Uh, and that's a common mistake that a lot of uh, you know, individuals um, make when first connecting uh, a magometer is not understanding the function or purpose of the uh, guard. Now. Keep in mind that the total current that uh, flows during an insulation resistance test is made up of three components. You have the charging current, which is uh, charging up the object's capacitance. You have the absorption current, which is the current that is being drawn into the insulation by the polarizing of the electrons. Initially, this is a high current, but drops um, over time at a uh, rate slower than the charging current. And then finally we have the conduction or the leakage current, which is the small steady state current uh, that divides into two parts, the conduction path through the insulation and the current flowing over the surface of the insulation. Now the current flowing over the surface of the uh, component uh, or the uh, current flowing over the surface is the component of the current that we really don't want to measure if we want to measure how good the insulation resistance is. So surface uh, leakage introduces errors into the measurement of the insulation resistance measurement. Therefore, ideally we would like to go ahead and remove this surface uh, current from our measurement. So again, what we want to see is what is the current flowing from the conductor through the insulating material to the concentric neutral. What we don't want is to influence or have the influence of the current flowing along the surface. Therefore the guard terminal gets connected onto the uh, semiconductor material and any of this surface 
uh, current gets pulled and guarded out of the measurement. So we're able to just focus on pure insulation resistance flowing through, or the leakage current flowing through the uh, insulator. Okay. Now, for an ethylene propylene rubber or EPR uh, and or a natural rubber uh, type of cable, we would expect to see leakage currents of about 20 microamps or 750 megohms would be typical or common values. Um, I failed to mention on the previous slide for a cross-link polyethylene, uh, typically we would expect to read somewhere around 10 microamps uh, or 1,500 megohms for a good healthy insulation. And for a paper insulated lead covered cable, uh, typically 50 microamps or 300 megohms would be considered an acceptable value. Now, cable splices and terminations will increase the leakage current because they provide additional leakage paths in, the par in parallel with the unit under test. Okay. Also, uh, we talked about basic uh, insulation resistance tests, um, IR tests. Um, now, another valuable property of insulation, but one that must be understood, is that it charges during the course of a test. The polar DC field applied by the tester causes realignment of the insulation material on a molecular level. As dipoles orient themselves with the field, this movement of charge constitutes, of course, a current. Its value as a diagnostic indicator is based on two opposing factors. The current dies away as the structure reaches its final orientation, while the leakage promoted by deterioration passes a comparatively large constant current. The net result is that with good insulation, leakage current is relatively small and resistance rises dramatically as charging goes to completion. This charging resistance is exactly what an experienced technician wants to see. Deteriorated insulation will pass relatively large amounts of leakage current at a constant rate for the applied voltage, and this will in essence flood out or mask any of the charging effects. Time resistance test methods, as they become known, take advantage of this charging effect, graphing the resistance reading at time intervals from initiation of the test yields a smooth rise curve for a good insulation, but a flat curve for a deteriorated insulation. The ultimate simplification of this technique is represented by the popular polarization index, PI, or dielectric absorption tests, which requires only two readings and a simple division. Performing the polarization index test, uh, the one minute reading is divided into the 10 minute reading, uh, thus providing a ratio. The dielectric absorption uh, time values are typically 30 seconds and 60 seconds. Obviously, a low ratio indicates little change, hence a poor insulator while a high ratio indicates the opposite and a healthy insulator. References to typical polarization index values are common in literature, which makes the test very easy and readily employed. Note that the resistance readings alone are difficult to work with, as they may range from enormous uh, values in new equipment down to just a few megohms uh, just before removal from service. A test like the polarization index test is particularly useful because it can be performed on even the longest of cables and yields a self-contained evaluation based on relative readings rather than on absolute values. So again, looking at our graphs over here, taking into account the charging effects of the uh, absorption in the capacitive currents, 
um, initially your insulation reading will be lower than final value um, as this uh, um, polarization and charging effect is taking place. But now as these currents start to drop off, insulation resistance begins to increase and in essence uh, all we're seeing then is the small amount of uh, leakage current flowing through the insulator. In the moist or contaminated insulation, right at the onset of the test, in essence, we start to pull a large leakage current, which, uh, as we said before, masks or hides the charging currents. And in essence, what we see is very little change, basically right from the onset of the test through the time period. All we see is just almost pure uh, leakage uh, current flowing through the insulator. To perform the test, basically, we connect the megometer and over time we take our one minute reading and up through our 10 minute reading. Okay, an example of a still more specialized test developed by EDF. Uh, France's National Power Utility is the dielectric discharge or the DD test. This test is performed with select megometers and measures the current that flows during discharge of the test sample. It is especially, excuse me, it is especially applicable to multi-layer insulations. The test item is first charged until full absorption has taken place. This can take anywhere between 10 to 30 minutes. At this time, capacitance is fully charged and the alignment of dipoles absorption is essentially complete. Only leakage current continues to flow. When the external voltage field ceases, molecules will relax and return to their original random configuration, constituting a reabsorption current. This discharge current is measured 60 seconds after the insulation test is finished. At this time, capacitance is discharged and the voltage has collapsed, so that the charge stored in the dipoles can be viewed independently of the masking currents, such as the leakage current that is dominant during the insulation test. A high reabsorption current indicates that the insulation has been contaminated, while a low current indicates that it is relatively clean. The precise definition of dielectric discharge is current flowing after one minute, typically in nanoamps, divided by the test voltage multiplied by the capacitance. This calculation provides a figure of merit that indicates the condition of the insulation. In a multi-layer insulation, each layer is meant to share this uh, voltage stress equally. Upon discharge, each layer's charge will decrease equally until no voltage remains. When a layer is faulty between good layers, and its leakage resistance will decrease while capacitance is likely to remain the same. A standard insulation test will be determined by the good layers and not likely to reveal this condition. But during dielectric discharge, the time constant of the faulty layer will mismatch the others to yield a higher DD value. A low DD value indicates that reabsorption current is decaying quickly and the time constant of each layer is similar. A high value indicates that the reabsorption exhi exhibits long relaxation times, which may point to a problem. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about overvoltage testing utilizing direct current voltages. For years, high voltage DC testing has been traditionally accepted method for judging the serviceability of medium voltage cables. DC high pots uh, or DC high potential tests uh, have worked well 
um, as a withstand and condition assessment test for uh, paper insulated lead covered or PILC cables. When plastic insulation cables were first introduced in the 1960s, DC was actually still the preferred uh, measurement method. As time moved on, plastic insulated cables became more abundant and began showing uh, aging effects uh, and surface aging. DC continued to be the dominant test, but concerns began to grow over the effectiveness of this test. In the early 1990s, reports uh, had started to surface indicating that DC high potential testing could be the blame for latent damage experienced by extruded medium voltage uh, cable insulations um, such as crossing polyethylene, PE, and EPRs. After receiving these reports, the uh, Electrical Power Research Institute, or EPRI, funded two studies related to the XLPE and EPR cables. These studies, uh, which uh, came out as EPRI Report TR-101245 and EL6902, yielded several conclusions regarding XLPE cable. One, the reports showed that DC high potential testing of field age cable reduces the overall life of the cable. The reports also showed that DC high potential testing of field age cable generally increases electrical tree growth. And finally, DC high potential testing before energizing new medium voltage cable doesn't cause any reduction in cable life. Now, the current version of most industry standards no longer include DC high potential testing uh, of extruded dielectrics such as XLPEs and EPRs as a maintenance-based test. Of those that still do uh, mention DC testing, all of the uh, procedures uh, have definitely reduced the time duration from a 15 minutes to only around a five minute time duration. None endorsed DC testing uh, as a factory uh, test for extruded uh, cables, but most continue to include DC testing as an acceptance test on newly installed extruded dielectrics. These industry standards also no longer endorse DC high potential testing as a maintenance test for extruded uh, um, cable types. Uh, now, by service age, we're typically referring to more than five years of age. So, although we will st still see some uh, recommended practices still mentioning the use of DC high potential testing when uh, dealing with installation or acceptance when the cable systems are new, um, almost all of the recommended practices have abandoned the use of DC testing for maintenance. Uh, purposes or particularly when the cable has reached service age. Okay, so why was over voltage DC testing found to be harmful to a service age cable? Again, the answer really comes back down to the treeing effects uh, within the insulate the insulation of an extruded dielectric under service age. Okay. Now as we go ahead and we run the high potential test, we start to look at the channel growth of the vented tree. And the warning or, uh, that's given in the uh, high potential DC testing is that it can actually accelerate, as we saw in this uh, um, slide, it can actually accelerate the growth of the particular tree. Now, again, it may also, uh, during the test, it may have taken and accelerated the growth of the tree and a tree that may have under normal service use still lasted maybe three to four years as a result of the 
accelerated growth caused by the DC high potential test, the cable may uh, fail in a few months. So again, this was the result of the EPRI studies where it was showing that that the high potential DC test actually promoted or accelerated uh, the channel growth of the trees. Now, DC acceptance tests uh, for installation um, and for acceptance. Uh, this particular chart was actually taken directly from uh, Okanite's uh, website and here we can see that DC uh, is still being called out for uh, you know installation and acceptance testing. Uh, this will give a guide as to for the phase-to-phase uh, -phase KV rating, conductor size, um, what levels of voltage that would be uh, applied uh, during the tests. Um, and notice that it's, it clearly states for the first five years. So after service age or after five years, uh, in essence, what even Okanite is saying here is no longer apply or use the DC testing. Okay, that's gonna conclude uh, part one of this webinar. Um, in part two, we will start to explore AC uh, high potential testing. We will also discuss the VLF and TAN delta measurements and partial discharge. So I thank you for your attendance of part one, and I hope you join us uh, and uh, play uh, part two as well. Thank you.